Good morning. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Tuesday, December 17th. We're joined today by the Minister of Education, the Honourable Tracy Ann McPhee, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Our sign language interpreter, Mary Thiessen and André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate are also with us today. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name and you will each have two questions. Before we begin, I would like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having a problem, please email eco at gov.yk.ca. Minister McPhee. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, here this morning. I'm pleased to be here with uh, Dr. Hanley on the traditional territory of the Kwan Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachan Council. We currently have one active case of COVID-19 here in the Yukon. This is welcome news after the recent clusters of cases that occurred in our territory. I wanna thank Yukoners from across the territory for practicing the safe six and for wearing a mask. Our continued dedication to physical distancing, keeping our hands clean, avoiding outdoor gatherings, is vital to keeping our community safe and healthy. So thank you to everyone. I also want to report uh, that there have been five new charges under the Civil Emergency Measures Act. These include three charges from our SEMA investigation unit and two charges that have been laid by the RCMP. Three of these charges have been for failure to self-isolate. One is for refusing to stop at the border and one is for refusing to wear a mask. I also wanna take this opportunity to thank our SEMA investigation unit and all of our partners across the territory who are working to keep Yukoners and visitors informed about the protective measures that are in place here in the territory. Today, I want to provide an update on busing. From the start of the school year, we have been adapting our school programming and our school bus services to meet the health and safety guidelines set by Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Adjusting to these new measures has presented challenges for many. While there have been challenges, the steps that we have all taken to limit the spread of COVID-19 and keep students, families, and our community safe have brought new opportunities and been successful so far. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of students and parents and families, of our school bus drivers, of our custodial staff, and of educators, school staff, and the staff at the department's central administration building. What you have all accomplished with your combined efforts during the first half of this school year is truly remarkable. Our efforts to adapt and support one another with patience and kindness and respect is inspiring. We know that the new way of doing things has taken an emotional toll on all of us. And we know that the announcement of new cases in the Yukon recently has been stressful. But they also remind us that we must still follow the safe six and wear our masks. Abiding by the rules has meant that we have been able to support students to continue to go to school each day and to see their friends and to learn face to face with their teachers. That is the real result. And I'm thankful that we've been able to do this while continuing to make sure that we are following the important health and safety measures. Because we know how important daily learning and being at school is to everyone's well being, we must keep this up. I'm pleased to be able to provide an update today about our new school buses and updated routes. This pandemic has forced us to adapt the way that we provide school busing to students in mostly in the Whitehorse in during this school year. While we have been able to accommodate all of our eligible students on the bus, we have not yet been able to accommodate as many students as we have in past years. We've also faced challenges of ensuring qualified school bus drivers are consistently available to support the school bus services. And like all employees at many businesses and organizations, school bus drivers have had to stay home when sick or showing some symptoms to be safe. 
I want to thank all of the school bus drivers who continue to support our students to get safely to and from school. Their work is critical. And we appreciate the new school bus drivers who have answered the call in a time when we have needed to pull together to help one another. And we know that when getting to school is difficult, it can have impacts on learning and on parents and guardians who need to get to work for the day. In order to assist, we have acquired three new school buses that will be in service starting on January the 4th. These buses will fill some of the gaps in service that are as a result of the adju adjustments that we have had to make this year. This includes the new buses will include a route along the Hamilton Boulevard corridor areas uh, to schools in Porter Creek and will include routes from Porter Creek and Whistle Bend areas to schools in Riverdale and Elijah Smith Elementary School. The buses are being deployed in these areas as part of our efforts to ensure that we can accommodate as many students as possible on the school buses based on the needs we are seeing across Whitehorse and where we know that there have been gaps in service. We are also making uh, some adjustments to our existing bus, route, bus routes to optimize the number of students who can ride the bus. These adjustments will allow us to accommodate some additional students on the current buses. For example, there are some bus routes where we observed that assigned eligible students are not riding the bus regularly and there are opportunities for other students to be safely designated a seat on that bus. In other cases, we are able to make an adjustment to a route to add a stop or to reroute the bus to accommodate an additional student. These updated bus routes will also take effect starting on January the 4th when students return to school from the holiday break. When school resumes in January, students will also start following some updated guidance to ensure that we are taking all necessary precautions to protect their health and safety and that, uh, and that of our bus drivers, our families and our communities. Dr. Hanley will provide more information on these updated health and safety guidelines for school bus operations that will take effect starting January the 4th. Additional families who are being accommodated will be notified directly by email with their bus number and that notification will be done by December the 23rd. If there are changes to a bus number a student is already assigned to, those families will also be notified. In making these adjustments, we're making every effort to limit the disruption to families who are already using a school bus. There will not be wide ranging changes to our existing school bus routes, but we do expect some minor changes across several routes where bus stops may be added and pick up and drop off times may be slightly impacted. Updated bus routes will also be posted on yukon.ca before December 23rd. We encourage families who are currently using the bus to make sure that they check the school bus schedule webpage on yukon.ca before returning to school in January. There may be some slight adjustments that you need to know about. And we urge you to continue to send your child to the school bus stop that is closest to your home. This has been a difficult and a different and a challenging school year. We are very pleased to be making these updates to incorporate new buses and to accommodate as many additional families as we can. These changes will increase our busing capacity, which is currently just over 1,900 students or seats to approximately 2,250 seats. We do appreciate the patience and the understanding of the families and the students and what they have shown over the last number of months. Thank you very much to everyone for your time today. Dr. Hadley. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Pat. Good morning, bonjour. 
The journey with COVID-19 over the previous nine months has tired us all, but we do have renewed energy and hope with the imminent arrival of vaccine. I want to also say thank you to all of you who have been patient and tolerant and who have demonstrated solidarity and kindness in the face of hardship. As one community, we have stayed strong, we have persevered, and we can see a finish line in sight. And without your determination and diligence, we could be in a very different situation than we find ourselves in now. For today, there are a few points I want to make uh, sure that I address. I want to take some time to revisit our last few months and describe some of the epidemiology of COVID-19 to date in Yukon. I will, uh, as the Minister states, add to her comments about the revised uh, busing guidelines with respect to updated, um, updated health and safety guidelines. And with the holidays quickly coming, I want to revisit our need for a consistent social bubble. So over these past few months, we have seen our case count increase substantially, particularly in the last few weeks leaving many of you with questions about what drove the sudden spike in cases. With many months of stability over the summer months, I think we felt a sense of calm in comparison to other jurisdictions. During the months of October and November, we saw a stuttering rise in cases week over week, and this left a feeling of greater uncertainty and increased anxiety, especially in the face of the second wave hitting most of Canada progressively harder. I want to review with all of you what we know from these last few weeks of Yukon cases and what we have learned that may influence the decisions that you make in the weeks to come. So let's revisit this past little while. Since October 1st, we have seen a total of 44 new cases within Yukon. 34 of those cases were in Whitehorse and 10.
tracing through YCDC and community nursing, and then either self-monitoring for symptoms or in self-isolation when their symptoms started. And these are cases that we like to see because they have little risk for onward transmission. And this speaks to the success of our contact tracing efforts and to the importance of keeping the numbers of your close contacts small. The tighter your bubble, the less chance for COVID to spread. Next slide. We're going to talk about age and sex distribution of confirmed cases. And next we'll go to a couple of graphs. Are we showing as uh, are, are we showing the slides or um, are they coming through? The slides are the audio cut out for a little bit. Oh, I see. A couple of minutes. Uh, okay. Should I be on standby? I'm awaiting instruction to proceed or to, yeah, okay, I'll keep going. Um, so recent, uh, so here we have the uh, distribution by age group and by, and by sex of, uh, of cases. And again, the earlier cases and the later cases. Earlier on the left, later cases on the right. And what we've seen is, uh, in this case, that the majority of our cases are younger adults in the 20 to 39 age group. There's a slight majority of females in this category, but I would treat these proportions as roughly 50-50. Children and youth in the minority, um, as are older adults. Um, and while not displayed here, we also know that the majority of our confirmed cases since early March have not had any risk factors for a severe disease. So in other words, we're seeing, we're, we're seeing this COVID infection uh, predominantly in young adults. And this is a pattern that we see in the rest of the country as well. So really what we're seeing in Yukon reflects or mirrors what we see in the rest of the country. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, this is uh, the same, but, to, but we really concentrate only on the index cases. And index cases means the first cases that are identified and not the contacts uh, that be, later become cases. So in other words, these are, these, are, these are people that are first coming forward with testing and uh, then being identified as cases. And again, here, we see the same, same pattern, uh, but more so where predominantly younger adults are... Um, are carrying and, tr and transmitting um, COVID infection in, in Yukon. Next, I want to go to slide um, uh, nine, where uh, we talk about signs and symptoms among confirmed cases. So what are we seeing? What patterns of symptoms are we seeing? If we go to the graph on slide 10, we see that um, here we, we see a list. So these are the most common symptoms that we see with confirmed cases. And so at the top is cough, and then runny nose, headache, fever or chills, fatigue, loss of taste and smell, myalgia, which means muscle aches, pharyngitis, which means sore throat, and shortness of breath. So these are all the, the, the common symptoms, again, that we see with COVID everywhere, but this is uh, what we've seen so far with Yukon. So the overwhelming majority of cases have a cough as one of their uh, symptoms. Um, now, these are usually m multiple. Um, so, uh, so in other words, w one person presents has, has several of these symptoms. And it is very rare to have a single symptom, particularly for some of the symptoms, such as runny nose. We know that um, in our cases, as well as in the in, in worldwide, that runny nose by itself is not, uh, is a r actually very rare as, a, as the only symptom that uh, is associated with COVID. And that's that's what influences our traffic light guidance. But you will notice that we've divided these by red and yellow to reflect our traffic light uh, symptoms. The red symptoms are the symptoms that we say these are these are symptoms to be very uh, um, 
very concerned about, and these are ones that we uh, emphasize the importance of testing as soon as possible. So you see cough and fever and loss of taste and smell, and shortness of breath as the, what you might call the cardinal symptoms of COVID showing up very frequently in our cases. And the other ones are less specific to COVID. They're common in many other scenarios, but when you're seeing these come up in combination of two or more, that's when we also, according to the traffic lights, really encourage a testing and isolating away from others. I'm gonna go on now. And uh, this is uh, the, the, the last uh, two slides. We're going to talk about clusters or how, how our cases have been grouped. And if we go to that last slide of a kind of a pictogram, uh, and, and here we, we show how our recent cases have been clustered. And this shows our recent cases with the last two major outbreaks and the connections between individuals in these outbreaks as well as some of the other smaller groupings or individual cases. Uh, the connections between the cases, as you see, that can be linear, in other words, just one in a straight line to another, or they can be multiple. And particularly within household settings, this is where we see that the connections between people can be in many, uh, many directions. And so you see that kind of pentagram at the, at the, the bottom, uh, or the star-like uh, figure where you, you see the multiple interactions between people. Um, and uh, uh, rather than just a single line by line. So what we, what we hope to avoid in our connections that spread out in long linear chains, suggesting that the virus is spreading out among people who were closely, uh, who are not so closely connected. So if we just saw a line and then another line and another line, that would be uh, the beginnings of spreading out into the community. We also don't want to see a whole lot of random cases popping up that are not connected either to known cases or clusters or at least to common settings. And so you see some of these are, are smaller groupings with, which might be just a single household um, or a single, a single travel acquired infection or cases that may not yet be closely connected but are suspected to be close, uh, suspected to be connected but we haven't proven that uh, or shown that link yet. We've seen COVID spread in these ways in all manners of people. And COVID, of course, is not exclusive to any ethnic group or age or income category. And in Yukon, COVID does not belong to any one social or ethnic group either. Instead, it travels from one person to another. When people are living together, working together, or congregating in the same setting, especially if people are not practicing the safe six or masking. So when we do congregate together, we need to remain vigilant and follow the safe six plus one, while also keeping bubbles small to limit that spread outwards. We will have some of this material developed into an infographic. I'm just showing you really the, the, the slides that, are, that are, are fresh and showing our recent data. But we will have a written summary and infographic so that we can illustrate these patterns of COVID transmission we're seeing in the territory, as well as the lessons learned from uh, these outbreaks. So our Yukon outbreaks have demonstrated the importance of COVID transmission within shared household settings and workplaces. And these patterns of spread reinforce the need to organize our social bubbles, to reinforce COVID safety measures in workplaces and any settings where the public gathers. Most importantly, it's important to stay home when you're ill and to seek testing when needed. I know it's kind of ingrained in us to push through when we have a tickle in our throat or when we feel overly tired. I understand and sympathize how difficult it can be to make that phone call to your employer and stay home from work. But these past few months have proven that going to work while sick can be detrimental to this community's well-being. And even though we now seem to have weathered this recent storm, we cannot relax just yet. If you feel sick, it is your personal and collective responsibility to avoid going to work, school, to the gym, or to socialize with friends. Sure, perhaps it will turn out to be just a cold, but remind yourself that that sore throat could be an indication of COVID-19. 
This school year has been challenging, demanding, at times exhausting. But as we near the end of the first term, we have shown how well we can do this. I know the year hasn't been busy, whether as students, as, as parents, teachers, bus drivers, support staff, council members, principals, all have stepped up and done a fabulous job in keeping our children in a safe learning environment. As a parent myself, I so appreciate all that you have done. Several weeks ago, the Department of Education asked me to consider the public health question of how many students could be safely uh, on a bus. So beginning January 4th, as Minister McPhee has noted, many additional students will be assigned a seat on the bus due to this review of busing ridership and some additional flexibility as needed to accommodate students. To add an extra layer of safety, we will require all students age five and older to wear a non-medical mask while on a school bus. Adding this requirement not only adds an extra layer of protection for both students and drivers, but allows for more students to take the school bus. Our new recommendations take the safety of both the students and the drivers into consideration, and we've ensured that neither the students nor the driver's safety is compromised. Our revised recommendations include monitoring your child's symptoms before sending them to school. Bus drivers must also assess themselves for daily symptoms. While waiting for the bus, students and parents or guardians are recommended to maintain two meters from others while at bus stops when loading and unloading onto the buses. All bus drivers will be required to wear a non-medical mask all students five years and older must wear a non-medical mask. And students who are four years old and uh, taking the bus are encouraged, uh, but will not be required to wear a non-medical mask. Note that this does not change the mask risk recommendations for within schools. That stays at 10 years and up for those common areas as defined in our public health guidelines for the schools. I hope this news will be received positively as families plan for the New Year's return to school. We are fast approaching the holidays and the trees are getting lit and lined up with garland and ornaments and Christmas shopping is ramping up. Last minute letters are being hastily mailed or emailed to Santa Claus. Usually this is the time of year when Families are traveling out or welcoming home family, hosting cocktail parties, cookie exchanges, gift swaps, visiting our loved ones, and generally making the most of this festive season. But unfortunately, as we all know, the pandemic had other plans for us and celebrations will be perhaps held with a little less cheer than usual. We know that holiday gatherings have the potential to fuel virus transmission. Repeatedly in other parts of the country or parts of the globe, we have seen the after effect of long weekends and other occasions play out in increased COVID spread, often serious surges. So we should not think in Yukon that we are any less susceptible as we have ourselves seen in recent weeks. These next weeks are going to be difficult for us in a number of ways. And as we await the coming of vaccine, we need to be well aware of the challenges ahead of us. That's why it's so important to maintain a social bubble during the holidays. I've briefly spoken to the social bubbles these past weeks and the need for consistency in the people you interact with. I know that it will be helpful for many to have straightforward rules on what to do. I still see a few questions looking for clarification around what a social bubble entails, what's in, what's out. It is true that each person or family has different circumstances that have to be considered. I know we can't cover every scenario, but please use common sense and keep in mind your goal is to keep your bubble small and consistent and safe. For the weeks ahead, I urge you to stay consistent with who you see in your social bubble. The ideal bubble is under 10 people with the maximum limit of 15. 
For some who have been following the social bubble guidelines diligently over the past months, if you have stuck to the same 15 people in your social bubble, that's okay. I don't want you to cut off physical contact with those who have been an integral part of your bubble, as long as all those people are loyal to the one bubble and nothing else. Still, I do urge you to maintain consistency. No bubble infidelity allowed. As a reminder, the ideal social bubble of 10 should start with everyone you live with, whether roommates, parents, partners, or children. Then you can add in your other selected few, whether extended family, neighbors, or close family friends. Remember, whether one household or two, when you reach 10 people, you are close to that limit. I am asking all of you to say, stay consistent with your social bubble. We need to minimize our number of contacts to ensure we're protecting ourselves, our loved ones, friends, colleagues, and our elders. We're all doing this for each other so that we can celebrate safely, but also enjoy the privileges that we still enjoy while most others around the country do not. So who can you have close contact with? Well, of course, with everyone in your social bubble. And you should continue to keep two meters away from people outside of your bubble. What should you avoid? Do not have holiday dinners or gatherings inside with anyone who is from outside your bubble. Do not change your bubble over the holiday period. And please use masks as the law now requires, but do not use masks to replace physical distancing. With vaccines around the corner, we can't blow it now. More than ever, we must maintain our social bubble and stay aware. As soon as we begin to slip and keep our guard down, COVID-19 will appear in a big way as it did a few weeks ago. Vaccine is near and much more will come about vaccine as we near the approval and then the arrival of the Moderna product. We're not currently at a place where we can begin loosening restrictions and we need to keep our eye on the prize. I know all of us hope that we can spend this time next year with all of our loved ones. To get there safely, we need to keep our gatherings safe, maintain distance from anyone outside of our social bubble. So key points from today, our own data shows us the effects of working or mixing when sick. So please stay home and away from others if you're sick. Keep your bubble small and consistent. Always remember the safe six plus one and use your mask. Or safe six plus two if we think of one other action, be kind. We have shown how well we can work together for success. Remember, we must stay together in this pandemic and we need to be kind to each other. That's all for my update. Thank you. Remember to take care of each other and stay well. Merci, merci, Cho. Thank you. We'll now go to the phone lines and we'll begin with Marin from Aurore Boreal. No questions, thank you. Let's see, we'll move to Haley, Yukon News. Thanks, my first question, obviously as a reporter, it was really interesting to see all that detailed data, um, but why make that public? I'm just curious um, um, what, uh, what the purpose is of, of sharing all that detailed information. Yeah, well, I guess one advantage of having um, having uh, lots of recent cases um, is that we can actually start to tell a story from this from this data. And I know that there have been many questions over the months about what we can show and uh, and and what can we describe of our own epidemiology and and we're always as as you know trying to trying to maintain that balance between um, between maintaining confidentiality, which is uh, so so important to maintain trust of uh, of uh, of people and individuals, and to do our due diligence, um, with also uh, trying to interpret what we're seeing, um, and so um, so I felt uh, an obligation uh, as soon as realistically possible to bring back. Um, 
the uh, the numbers that we are seeing, but I think more importantly the story that's behind the numbers, and and so that I think will be a, a continuing uh, quest as as we work through um, work through this uh, pandemic, uh, whether it's uh, case information and summary information. Uh, whether it's other other things that we can describe, uh, characteristics, um, or um, as we head towards uh, the vaccine, um, uh, vaccine uh, uptake, vaccine knowledge, and uh, and and any uh, statistics that we can share around that, as we have uh, for the influenza immunization. Thank you. Follow up question, Haley. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, I guess my second question is probably for Minister McPhee. I was just curious if there's any more context around the charges laid in the mask incident. I know sort of the line has been um, that education will come before enforcement. What was it in this case that resulted in a charge being laid for failure to wear a mask? Thanks, uh, Haley, for the question. Um, of course, uh, wearing a mask in public spaces is enforceable uh, under the uh, CIMA. Um, and uh, we always seek, as you've said, to com have compliance through education, awareness, and support. Uh, but we have noted, of course, that uh, the RCMP might be required to investigate uh, if um, there is a situation that is uh, egregious or the refusal is egregious. Um, I can't speak about the specific case, but what I can say is that the uh, the reported circumstances of that matter were egregious, and the individual was uh, was clearly refusing to cooperate. Thank you. We'll move to Philippe, CBC. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hanley, in your comments today, you mentioned COVID not being exclusive to any ethnic group. Uh, you haven't provided data uh, dividing it that way. We do have numbers from Northern Health uh, and other regions of BC. So the example from Northern Health, uh, Indigenous people there are uh, getting COVID at twice the rate of the non-Indigenous population. Uh, will we be releasing those numbers for Yukon? And do you have any comments about the breakdown in that way of, uh, of looking at it? Yeah, thank you. It's it's a really good question, and and it's I, I think it's another one of those areas that I I hope to be able to bring back. Um, but it's a matter of looking and verifying and consulting. Um, so looking at what 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 we have and uh, at what level that we feel comfortable sharing that again in in that uh, context of protecting uh, I, the the potential for self identification and protecting confidentiality. The other uh, I think the other key area is that we need um, once we have that. Is we need uh, adequate um, consultation, particularly with our um, with our indigenous leaders, um, uh, which is what we always do when um, when divulging any data that uh, would involve um, indigeneity, um, particularly from a health point of view. So I, I do think that we're this is sort of early early steps, um, and the important thing was to give this sort of more holistic um, information. Um, I don't think uh, again we, we're dealing with very small numbers, so so interpreting trends, even if we compare ourselves to Northern Health, um, where um, uh, significantly lower, I, I think a tenth of about of the population or, or even less. So we, we, do, um, we do have more limitations about what we can share um, when we start to break, down, break out uh, the data like that. So I think it's a, it's a good question, and I, I think it's something I'd, I'd like to bring back in, at some level. Um, uh, but um, we're not quite there yet. Follow up, Philippe. Uh, yes, I would have a different question for the education minister. Uh, I just wonder about uh, masks uh, being provided to students very early in the school year. We talked about an order of masks, and uh, do you mind giving us an update on masks for students? Uh, sure. Uh, we have, as I said, I think all along and several times, maybe uh, even in this room and, and others, uh, in, of course, uh, encourage the uh, mask use by students. Um, they are uh, becoming uh, quite a, a fashion uh, statement in some circles, and I know that individuals are choosing uh, to uh, have their own masks and bring their own masks. We encourage that, of course, uh, because they're very personal items. If uh, students do not have access to masks, uh, they are 
are provided at the school. They are clearly uh, a uh, safety precaution, part of our uh, health and safety measures uh, available at schools to students uh, and to staff if, uh, if necessary and to visitors uh, if there were uh, visitors at the school. Uh, definitely uh, available uh, through the department, through the schools, through the access uh, that students have uh, at their individual schools. Thank you. We'll move to John from CKRW. John's off the line now, actually. Okay. Luke from CKRW. Yes, I have a question for uh, Dr. Hanley. Uh, this may have been uh, discussed in a previous COVID-19 briefing, uh, but just for an update, when is somebody considered recovered from COVID-19, just given the inconsistent nature of the symptoms associated with it? Yeah, that's a really good question, uh, and uh, we have we do have there there are kind of standard uh, criteria, um, but given just what you said, uh, how um, how variable symptoms can be um, and and unpredictable, we always we we take those standards and then apply it on very much on an individualized basis. So the um, the the standard for someone who is otherwise healthy and not in hospital is a 10-day period between symptom onset um, and then recovery. And that uh, then assumes that everything is going well, the symptoms have cleared, and we like to see um, a two-day, at least a two-day period at the, at the, of, of free of symptoms. Um, and uh, and yeah, clinical so clinical recovery plus that time duration, uh, plus no recent symptoms, and that sort of is our package that we apply to recovery. Now it gets more complicated if you have someone who is hospitalized, someone who has uh, immunocompromised, and there we are, we usually go with a 20-day uh, window, which which um, leads to the longer recovery times that have been associated with some of our um, some of our cases. And again, it's still and individualized. You can actually have individuals who actually have ongoing symptoms and who just take much to take longer to uh, to recover. Uh, and so, of course, that's where the uh, uh, the individual conversation and, and assessment. And that's usually done again with with uh, YCDC, uh, with us as um, the medical officers of, of health weighing in, and um, with the care the, the the family physician or or the community nurse uh, caring for the caring for the patient. Do you have a follow-up, Luke? Uh, yes, I have a question for Minister McPhee. I know uh, you went over the numbers in your earlier remarks, but uh, just how many more students are uh, being uh, accommodated with these new buses? Uh, thanks, uh, Luke, for the question. Uh, we have we're currently accommodating a little over 1,900 uh, eligible students, and the uh, three buses and the adjustments to small adjustments to other routes will allow uh, about 2,250 students. So there's approximately 350 additional students will be accommodated. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll move to Claudiane, Radio Canada. Euh, oui, d'abord en français, Dr. Henley, juste euh, nous donner les grandes lignes euh, des, de vos euh, directives pour le temps des fêtes. Qu'est-ce qui, qu'est-ce que les gens doivent retenir pour euh, le temps des fêtes? So, Dr. Henley, could you please give us the uh, the highlights of your uh, directions for uh, the holidays? What exactly you want people to do during this time? Oui, merci. C'est um, les directives uh, sont uh, encore um, un, um, une petite uh, 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 répétition de ce que j'ai j'ai uh, j'ai expliqué avant, mais juste pour réemphasiser l'importance pendant les uh, les journées de, de vacances, uh, pendant les fêtes, pour garder les boules, pour garder les boules consistantes, de pas changer les boules pendant ce temps. De, de garder le maximum de 10 personnes jusqu'au 15 dans les circonstances individuelles um, et um 
et, et de ne pas, de pas mélanger, euh, d'assurer de, de que chaque personne dans la boule, c'est fidèle à cette, euh, à, à cette boule. Donc, pour maintenir, entretenir la, la, la boule euh, et si on, si on a des contacts avec des personnes euh, euh, au-delà de la boule, euh, ça, ça, ça doit être gardé à distance euh, avec toutes les, tous les mesures euh, de, euh, de, 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 de sécurité et, et avec des masques. Donc, euh, c'est pour euh, revenir. Euh, on est dans une situation euh, très bonne à, à ce moment avec un cas seulement actif, mais toujours on joue avec le risque. Et euh, on sait que le temps fait, euh, c'est normalement un, un, un moment très festif euh, avec des rassemblements de gens. Et donc, c'est une mise en garde pour... Euh, pour, euh, pour euh, pour avoir toutes les forces pour, euh, pour nous protéger pendant ce temps-là euh, et euh, de, 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 de retienne cette, euh, cette, euh, tout, tous les efforts pour garder contre la transmission de COVID-19. Euh, et on espère qu'on peut faire ça pendant tout le temps de fête et après, jusqu'au moment de vaccin. Merci. Avez-vous une autre question, Claudiane? Oui. Uh, so, I'll ask in English, but because uh, I don't know who between the minister or Dr. Henley will be able to answer, but I would also like a French version of the answer if, if it's uh, suitable. So, with the arrival of the vaccine, um, given that the vaccine will not be distributed amongst children, so those under 18 years old, how long before we can contemplate going back to school full-time? I don't know. Do you want to talk about the, the effect of the vaccine and what we think it will be in the community? Because I think that's the answer. I can add to that if necessary, but... Oui, euh, je peux, je peux essayer, c'est, c'est, oui, c'est, c'est une très bonne question, euh, mais c'est, euh, euh, c'est très difficile d'être définitif euh, de, de le point de vue de santé publique à ce moment parce que euh, c'est, je peux parler peut-être de toute la question de mesures publiques et quand on a euh, surtout dans, dans, dans cette période où on, on, est, on est assuré d'avoir assez de vaccins pour toute la, popula toute la population adulte mais pas encore pour les jeunes et on, on anticipe euh, on, que, que ça, ça va venir uh, plus tard. Donc, comment ça joue de, avec uh, l'enlèvement éventuel de toutes les mesures et, et, uh, et avec um, uh, um, quel... Um, Uh, combien de temps est-ce qu'on attend pour ça Et ça, c'est les questions que même au niveau national, même au niveau na international, on ne sait pas la réponse. Donc, pour le, pour le moment, on, uh, on, on continue dans, avec toutes les mesures publiques, um, au moins jusqu'au fin de, de période de vaccination. Um, et, et, et dans, dans les prochains mois, avec tout, bah, une accumulation d'expériences de, et d'évidences, on va être plus euh, au point de, de donner des recommandations pour l'enlèvement des mesures publiques. Donc, le, la question d'éducation, c'est très lié à, à cette, euh, cette question. Euh, je, je crois que... Euh, on, on planifie maintenant pour l'année la, pour scolaire de continuer la même que, euh, avec toutes les mesures qu'on a euh, et avec l'addition qu'on que, que a expliqué aujourd'hui. Mais, mais comme ça, je pense que euh, ça ne va ch pas changer pendant cette année euh, scolaire. Je vais vous demander de répéter ça en anglais, s'il vous plaît. Oui, je vais le faire. I was um, so there are many, the, the 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 question really is around uh, to to take it one level up. The the question is around how how will we start to remove public health measures when we have 
um, our uh, when we have vaccine and when we have a vaccinated population, um, and also the the question of when we have adults um, vaccinated but not children, how will that play out, particularly with regard to education? And I think these are these are questions we just don't know the answers yet to, um, and and we we anticipate that with more experience, with populations actually receiving the vaccine, with more evidence from the studies, um, and and more actual data. We we will start be able to start to anticipate. Um, of course, what what a lot of it depends on is what what will the eventual population uptake be. So all of these are going to take months to play out. Um, so I don't anticipate that that would mean that there would be changes to the public health guidance for schools in the coming months, or effectively for the for the upcoming uh, second half of the of the school year. I, I think it'll take us longer to be able to know how to adjust public health measures um, in a vaccinated population. Thank you. Minister McPhee? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, I also think it's important, claudia to remind everyone and your, your listeners that all students in the territory, uh, kindergarten to grade nine, are attending school. Uh, your words were full-time, but certainly for full days. Uh, all students in rural Yukon are attending school uh, from K to 12, uh, full days. And that uh, I think your references to the grades 10s to 12 at the three high schools here in Whitehorse that are doing full-time learning, but are only in front of their teacher or with their teacher for half a scheduled school day. But their learning is full-time and the full curriculum is being taught. So just as, as a reminder, um, that is uh, the current situation. And I think it's, um, it's uh, certainly by all accounts uh, faring well. And uh, the last reminder I'll make is that if there are, are there are students in 10 to 12 at one of the three high schools here in Whitehorse that are having difficulty uh, or challenged by that situation, there are additional supports. Uh, we're working one-on-one -on -one with students to make sure that their challenges are being uh, are being met and they're being supported. Thank you. We'll move to Danielle, CBC. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I'm not sure who would be best to answer this question, but has any protocol been developed in the case that there is a case of COVID-19 or an outbreak in a school? Oh, sure. I mean, if you want to, I can too. Or you, you go start? first. Okay. You go first, Ella. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for the question, Danielle. Of course, there are uh, protocols and uh, and uh, operational plans for each school in the territory. They are based on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, and uh, Dr. Hanley will uh, will add to this as well. Um, schools are different than uh, public spaces. Um, they each have uh, an operational plan that. Uh, limits the mixing of students and keeps students' interactions uh, to their core learning groups or their groups of classmates, which supports contact tracing and uh, isolating uh, in a, if there were to be a positive case. We are um, well aware of the uh, situation when schools needed to be closed in the spring, and our goal, of course, is to keep as many students attending school as face-to-face -face classes as we can while, of course, ensuring their health and safety. Um, schools are like small communities. Um, in the event that uh, there were a case identified by a, a, of a student or a staff member or others that might work, uh, educators in the school, um, we would follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Yukon Communicable Disease Center and Control Center, and they would identify and um, directly notify any of the close contacts and provide direction on who will need to be uh, staying home or who will need to self-isolate or any of the impacts uh, on the operation of the school. So it will be an assessment of the risk factors. It will be an assessment of the situation, assessment of those uh, involved and of the, um, the seriousness of the matter and the um, advice from uh, YCDC and from the Chief Medical Officer of Health will, of course, be followed by the school and the school community. Thank you, Minister McPhee. Dr. Henley? 
Yeah, I, I think the minister outlined it very well. And, and just in, in addition to everything that the minister explained, uh, these have been, since actually the very beginning, these these protocols have been worked on and with uh, YCDC and uh, us as um, um, the medical officers of health in, in, um, in collaboration with YCDC and with the Department of Education uh, to not only um, work them out, but to update them according to um, national guidance as it uh, as it gets updated, um, but also to rehearse that. Um, so, um, so to bring that to the uh, administrators, which which we did to kind of walk through how this would occur. And uh, like the um, minister says, there there are so many individual circumstances that will. Um, will uh, kind of influence uh, the decisions made around uh, either a, a child or a family, um, the child's siblings um, being uh, removed from the school or, or the implications for, for the classroom um, or even for the entire school. And it really depends on on that, that risk assessment process. So we do have, I, I would say, a, a well-established and a well-rehearsed uh, protocol should there be a case uh, in the school. Thank you. Danielle, do you have another question? Yeah, I guess just kind of getting that. Thank you for laying it out so well for me. Um, so say if there was a case in a school tomorrow, schools would be following their own operational guidelines and then consulting with who from there? And, and are there laid out guidelines that are public? Um, I'm just trying to understand it better, but what would happen, say, if there was a case in a school tomorrow? How that would kind of go down step by step? Yeah. So really, the 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 first step is a uh, in the in the guidelines is a reach out to YCDC so that the communicable disease control experts uh, be become involved uh, from the very beginning and then working together with the school um, um, so that the the um, officials in the school are notified and of course then the family is immediately involved and notified um, and then it's that risk it's that history taking process which we do with every case is what what's the story um, and where did that that person, where did the child um, acquire the um, an infection or seem to have acquired the infection? So it could be something as simple as uh, the child acquired the infection as a, as a household um, uh, contact of another case that might have just been um, um, been evident and everything occurred over a weekend and there are no implications for the school whatsoever. Um, or it may be, um, may, may be something where the, the, the child was um, infectious or presumed to be infectious during the time in the classroom, but within a very defined um, um, a very uh, defined uh, group or cohort and therefore there would be uh, contact implications for notifying the, the people that need to be notified and, and no one said they could follow the again the advice that would be from communicable disease control um, which um, w which would invo involve either self-monitoring at home or self-isolation so again depending on where we think the transmission occurred or may have occurred and what the risk is and, and what the circle of possible contacts is. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move to Tim, Whitehorse Star. Yes, good morning. Good morning. All right, uh, my question is for Dr. Hanley. I'm curious as to whether he was involved in the discussion on the uh, decision to cancel the Whitehorse uh, New Year's Eve fireworks. Tim, uh, I responded to that question yesterday. Yes, but I'd like something from Dr. Handley, please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's the first I've heard about this, so um, I guess I wasn't involved. Do you have a follow-up, Tim? Yes, my follow-up on that would be, uh, if you're familiar with the, the cancellation, uh, is that reasonable, the thing to do under the COVID guidelines? You know, uh, I think it might be just um, worthwhile kind of going over how um, how we provide guidance um, and then um, uh, um, keep, uh, I generally try to keep an arm's length from individual decisions um, because they're made um, based on so many circumstances. Um, and so what uh, what generally we do is we give the kind of the, the uh, um, a picture of what, what are the risks, what are the mitigations around the risks, and 
and does it work for that organization? And so that takes into consideration how big how big is the organization? Are there are there guests? Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? Um, what are the anticipated? Um, how, how might the gathering occur? Um, how how well can it be monitored? How well can it be supervised and controlled? Um, you, you know the duration there. So it, it's really giving the, the the kind of the template uh, where you might find risks uh, and how you should mitigate and uh, mitigate those risks, and then really letting the the organization decide based on their own capacity um, to to decide whether it's feasible or not to be able to carry on and adhere to the guidance. So I, I generally don't say yes or no, uh, but but we within our team work with those organizations so that they can walk through those, uh, those risks and, and see whether it's feasible to mitigate those risks or not. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for their time this morning and a reminder that we did have some audio issues earlier, so we will be posting a summary of the uh, EPI slide presentation and the infographic. Our next COVID-19 update will take place Tuesday, December 22nd at 9.30 a.m.